Hi. Hi, everybody. Thanks for staying. I um, want to tell you about the SLIC project, the SLIC system that we are building in computer science. We started about 2006 with this project and it keeps going and growing and we are thankful for uh, organizations that helps us. We are thankful for all the many students that help us. Building all the SLIC stands for semantically linked in, in structural context browsing systems. I think that the acronym is much cooler than the explanations. And uh, let me tell you what it is all about. Okay, so there are plenty and plenty of sources of educational videos. The obvious is, of course, a uh, distance learning applications, where, but there are also colloquium and seminars that are given there. There is presentations in companies that are people bring slides to these presentations and to all the other ones. And we want to ask, how can I take a lecture that was recorded by a non-professional photographer um, designed in a non-professional, not initially planned to be into distance learning application and make this video much more accessible and uh, easy to find for a student to find what he or she is after in this video. The other goal was, hey, there is plenty of things that appears in professional distance learning videos, you know, with the talking heads and the well-designed slides that do not appear, that are all missing in the other slides, they call it amateur uh, videos if you wish, at which uh, we think that there is lots of values in show the instructors in full, show all the body sides, show all the enthusiasm out there that are lost in some of the other techniques. But, so we have a plenty of little gadgets that we can do to the video to create kind of, maybe you can call it virtual reality, augmented reality of making the video somehow much easier accessible. But let me start by just saying what is the first tool to look for what you're after in the video, which would be, of course, to segment the video into individual shots. And now from every shot, every segment of the video, I will take a single frame and create a, the storyboard of all these frames so I can, in one look, uh, see what's happening inside, inside this video. Everybody that works with any video editing tools familiar with storyboards, but we were wondering, is this a way to create good segmentations, good accessible, for educational videos? And we think that if there are slides involved in the video, then the If there are slides involved in the video, then um, we can do much better. Then we can actually ask, take the video, find where is the part that the first slide was used, then where is the part that the second slide, maybe they came back to the first slide, move on, and just bring the video into the separating parts according to the slide used. Here is how the uh, the system looks like, our main website looks like, the, of the slick uh, system. So here once, the here is the video display. That's where you see the video of the lecture running. Here you can see the storyboard, which are just all the slides used during this talk. You can scroll to the left and the right, but that's, uh, um, actually a great way to see, look for interesting parts because our visual system is so well adapted. So it's easy to see, here is a slide of something that interests me, that's where I can go into. And you might think of application of universities that I know of that have cameras uh, attached to the ceiling and recorded automatically every course that happens out there. So these slides will be uh, a very fast way to use it. Now, this screen will show you either the slide that is presented in this way, 
uh, uh, presented it this moment in the video, or if you'll put your mouse on one of the slides because it's too tiny, it will enlarge and look much clearer. And these slides are synchronized with what's happening inside the talk, and we will use this fact later. So here, if I'll be, is an example of how working with a slide looks like. So we have this bar, a um, wonderful talk by uh, Wayne Coates that, about Chia, which is, by the way, fascinating uh, on its own right. And as I move the mouse from slide to slide, it's enlarged. And if I double click on one of the slides, the video will jump to this point. So I can just watch a segment of the video that I really care for. How do we do it? Well, we first take every slide. We assume that they are extracting the slide or somebody gave us a, the deck of the slides used specifically for at this video. And if I have the slides, I first need to find how to match a point to a point in the slide to point in the frame of the lecture, which is you know, called finding the homography. But it's kind of easy once we find which point goes to which point in the corners and the remaining points are somehow found uh, by linear interpolation. Then we, find, we ask for every slide and every frame. Is this slide appears in this frame, which involves finding a lot of interesting points in the slide, a lot of interesting points in the frame, trying to match what is what and find some consistent matching out there. And it might be, uh, sometimes it's very easy if the slide is clear and large. Sometimes it's pretty tricky because slides are similar to each other. There is blurriness introduced by the camera, by the projector. A uh, slide might be much smaller. We're still very proud of the results that we are getting so far. And then basically the main algorithm is for every, look for every slide, every frame. Do they match to each other? Is there a continuous set of frames that all uses the same slide? That's a segmentation that we are getting to, and that's how the main algorithms works. And I don't have time, of course, to go into the details. Next step is take the slide and segment it. Stay with me a second. The cool parts are still yet to come. So take the segment and segment it, parse it. That is, see for which each word in the slide where it appears for each figure, where it appears in the slide, etc. So now we know each slide, how exactly it is constructed. And here is the immediate application to do text search. Since I know what are, is a text, then I can, since I know what the text of each slide, I can go to a, the text search, type chia in this case, and up goes only slides that contains chia in them and I can pick one of these slides and start watching the video from the point where this particular slide is used. And it's useful for one, a video of one talk, but think about archive of many of the whole course or many courses in the university, and you can still get immediately in two very quick types to only the part of the video that you really care for. And then we started uh, discovering this Christmas tree of other applications that happens all once we know uh, this alignment between time and, ge and ge uh, geometry of the slides. So here is the first application, all back projection. This part is the original frame of the slides, uh, quite blurry. But now we take the slides that we know where and how it appears and we just you know, stack it into each one of the frames. So it's an old video, but the part of the video inside the frame is back projected and it, of course, there is no noise in it because it's original slide, so it's much clearer and crisp and readable. So of course the result is much more accessible. Another application, dynamic range enhancement. So I took this picture with my chip camera on my cell phone and you can barely see the slides and everything else is in the dark because the camera mostly sees this white object. On the other hand, you can enhance, uh, add the intensity of everything. Some of the details appear. It looks actually much better on the computer screen there rather than in this projector. And you can enhance it, but then the details of the, of the slide disappeared because they are just oversaturated. 
or you can do the two things separately because now you know where the slide is. So enhance the background while keeps the slide as it was beforehand, and suddenly you have a much crisper frame. And as I said, it's, it's something that is done for every frame of the video. Now, while we are targeting by far, a uh, lot of the distance learning by, by far will be commuters. They'll use uh, cell phones or iPad and so on to, uh, to watch the v educational videos. So uh, battery life and energy consuming start to be quite important. So here we take an, a slide. It's an imaginary slide. I don't think that the Beatles and Pythagoras was ever on the same slide in reality. And um, we start changing it so that on the display it will use much less energy. So, but since we know the pulsing of the slide, we know what are the main bullets, and they stay within the same color as before. So you can take it a bit to the extreme. Now the whole slide is more uh, gloomy and dark, but hey, it requires much less energy. And the important information of, oh, important of formation of what the fonts and which color and what the uh, uh, figures are, they all remains as they were before. Or alternatively, you can take the text and make it on white, on black, which, well, you're using the colors, but it's much more crisp when you're reading it in sunlight conditions. Now, which one is better, this or this or this? I don't know, but that's why we are generating a few videos from the same lecture, and you can switch between them according to whichever you, you want. Well, here is back projection of the same lecture about Shia, but now the slide is back projected to be black and white. So here is are a few other examples of energy consuming slides. Well, it's not a great, very uh, uh, happy slide if you wish, but it's much more energy saving if the information is there. Okay, sorry, there is some issues with um, if you are sending the slide, the uh, video through some channel, you can compress it in an intelligent way because the slides and the video are sent separately. And if you are losing details of the video, they will happen in the less important parts of the background, and the, sli the test slides themselves will not suffer from the compression. And then we started to think about how other I can help either the people that use small screens or p uh, understanding gestures done by the lecture. What you see here are intentionally a bit blurry video with a laser pointer running out there. It looks white rather than red in the video itself. That's what we are doing for this video, creating a new video where every bullet that was pointing to is now enlarged, much more crisp, taken from the original slide, and you see this fake a laser pointer to uh, identify where exactly you're pointing to. And so it's much more useful video, much more readable. For example, if you're like me, have serious ADHD, and that helps you concentrate about what's going on on the slide at this moment. We pass the slides, we can do the same for images in the slide as well as in text. And loud the image that the user, with, that the lecturer refer to. Now, we can also uh, do this enhancement based on first. speech recognition. We ran the speech Good recognition example, on the text, and you can see that the slides react yeah. in this video, okay. enlarged and react to whatever is discussed right in the speech recognition. Now, it doesn't have to be the very same word that is mentioned in the bullet, but we ask which are the bullets that you can ask the similarity between context, different contexts, like there is WorldNet, there is a Google distance that says how much this term is related to this term, and that's how we find which bullet is discussed at this particular moment. Other application. No, maybe the user doesn't actually, maybe the lecturer actually use other gestures to point to things on the slide. Maybe he's using a stick, maybe he's using his hand. We are enlarging or emphasizing what you are pointing into. And as I said, the nice thing is 
It requires some 3D understanding of what you are pointing into, but we are doing it on videos that we're taking with a single camera without the help of any other technology. So that requires a few tweaks. How do, we do, how do we do it? Well, we look at the slide and we look at the, sh at the shadow that where I'm pointing on. We turn on the slide and if you think about it for a moment, the intersection point of the stick and the shadow of the stick is exactly where you are pointing into. That's how there is some uh, noise involved in some te techniques to clean it, but that's the outside the result. Here is application that actually is trying to help people, bilingual students. This is a lecture that was given originally in English. Uh, the slides originally are in English, but as I mentioned, our system synchronized the slide presented in this moment with the talk itself. So we have the original slide, and then we have the slide translation, translated into Parsi, in this case. And they are changing as the talks goes. So if you understand some of the terms, but some are new to you, and uh, the, then, the Parsi, uh, then you will find in the translation something useful. Of course, it's not as good as giving the talk originally in Parsi, but it's all the effort is but it's much easier a uh, work than any other way of translation that I, can that I can think of. Okay, potentially it can help uh, visi uh, visibility impaired students by if you're bringing your computer to the classroom with a camera that watched on what are the slides that are happening, if we are pre-index them, then the computer is on sync. So it will, can uh, display it much larger, what's happening right now. It can display a, um, it with a Braille printer if, uh, for, uh, if that's what is needed. And here is a bit of a vision that we have into use our system to create a whole Wikipedia of all educational videos. Think about it this way. I take the first educational video and I create, create it using our system into the slides of this video. That's for video one. And I did the same for video two. Now, a slide is very concise, very clean way to represent the piece of data. So I can relatively easily link my slide to somebody else's slide to see if we are talking about the same thing. So think about the potential. You're hearing me giving a talk about slick. You realize that you don't understand what you're speaking about. And you jump to somebody else giving a talk about the same thing. You jump to his talk or her talk at the very same point, only on the very same level. And you're getting exactly the data that you want just for the same terms. Or connect it to the real Wikipedia. Or connect it to the electronic textbooks. They are all suddenly become a whole network that you can move from each other, but getting exactly the data that you want to study. And I believe that that's all I have to tell you. Um, thanks very much. That's, uh, our address.